webinar series. Um, my name is Nadia Steinzer. I'm the Eastern Program Coordinator for Earthworks. And um, this uh, is the last webinar in a series that we've done on the oil and gas build-out, um, which is more commonly known as infrastructure. Um, so for the first um, several years of the shale oil and gas boom, um, both proponents and opponents uh, focused on production. Um, while drilling and fracking are obviously still very big concerns, um, we've also moved into a new phase of development, which is this build-out and infrastructure. And at Earthworks and many other organizations, and, and obviously folks living with oil and gas, by infrastructure we mean everything that supports oil and gas development as a whole. So in addition to pipelines, compressor stations, processing plants, we also have aspects like waste, um, and that's what we're talking about tonight. It, they're all kind of different spokes in the oil and gas development wheel. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as oil and gas development expands across the country, even if you live in a place without drilling, um, chances are that you're affected by some kind of infrastructure. Um, I live in New York, and we are definitely getting a lot of pipelines, compressor stations, as well as a lot of waste. Um, so that's one reason I'm interested in this topic. Um, the other topics in our webinar series have um, included community participation and planning around infrastructure, air, climate, and health impacts of the infra infrastructure build-out, and the public costs of pipeline expansion. And this webinar tonight will be recorded, and then all of those webinars are available by recording and with additional um, information. Um, but tonight, uh, you're going to hear about um, what is an often overlooked impact of the oil and gas build-out, and that is the risk to the environment posed by large volumes of waste, both liquid and solid, um, that are created during drilling and fracking. Um, so I'm going to give an overview of the topic and introduce what state and federal regulators should do to address the problem and things that we can all do in our own um, states and communities. And then um, we have the pleasure tonight of hearing from John Noel, who is the National Oil and Gas Campaign's Coordinator for Clean Water Action based in Washington, D.C. And John is going to discuss the impact of a provision in the Safe Drinking Water Act that allows oil and gas companies to inject uh, wastewater directly into aquifers. Yes, you heard that right, um, but John's going to set us straight in what it means and what's being done about it. Um, prior to working at Clean Water Action, um, John received his Master's in Global Environmental Policy from American University and also worked at the Environmental Protection Agency in the Office of Water and many other things. Um, so it's great to have John here tonight and he will follow, his presentation will follow mine. Um, so can everyone see my screen? Hillary, are we good? Yes, looks good. Thanks, Nadia. All right, thank you. Um, so why the fuss now um, over waste? Um, and that is a picture of a large uh, wastewater impoundment in Pennsylvania being, being constructed. You can see the scale of it. Um, so the scale of change is what has brought uh, more attention to waste. Um, we now have 1.1 million oil and gas wells nationwide. Um, we're getting a lot more deep wells in new formations, which is leading to the creation of a larger volume of waste per well, as well as many more wells. And the second issue is that it's closer to home. Um, as, we, as I said earlier, you know, with the infrastructure build out, we now have oil and gas development in many, many more states and communities than was the case before. So you have more people paying more attention to the development and being concerned with all aspects of it, including waste. Um, as I mentioned before, too, there's also just been a kind of create it now and figure it out later approach to the infra to infrastructure. You know, we'll figure out how to transport the gas later, and that's certainly been the same attitude with waste. Um, we're just, you know, regulators are starting to play catch up on the impacts um, and to suddenly say, oh my goodness, there's a huge volume of waste being created and how do we adjust our regulatory and policy systems so that we can properly handle it. Um, and there's just been a surge in understanding about what the waste contains and study about the content of it and the risks of it, which I'll get into. So with all this new information, it's clear that the waste has a toxic and sometimes radioactive content. 
The other issue that's really um, come to the fore is capacity constraints. How do we handle the growing volumes? How do we dispose of the liquid waste? Um, you'll hear from John about how it's being disposed of underground, um, what happens when it goes to our wastewater treatment plants, and then landfills. And we'll get into all of that a little bit more. So first I just want to um, introduce a bit uh, what the waste is, the what, why, and where of it. Um, these are, this is a picture of a, um, a waste pit, an open air waste pit. They're called reserve pits um, that stay on well sites. This one is in Pennsylvania. And that's where a lot of the uh, liquid waste just kind of gets stored temporarily before it's hauled off site. And then um, many people have seen these trucks going around in the winter spreading um, what's called brine. And that is also a liquid waste product, um, often made up, uh, presumably, we're told, um, only with the brine, the saltiest water from um, conventional well drilling, meaning not from deep shale wells. But um, that is uh, one of the ways that it's managed, um, so to speak. <laughs> so what is liquid waste? Um, it is there, there are two primary categories of liquid waste. The first one is produced water. And that's what most um, people mean when they refer to brine. They mean the produced water, which is the water that's brought up from the formation. So whether it's the Marcella shale or the Barnett shale or you know, any formation where you bring up um, oil and gas, you get a lot of water that is naturally occurring in the formation that comes back uh, during drilling. And it's extremely salty. Um, because it's from deep underground. The other category of liquid waste is called flowback, which is what flows back after it's been injected. So, um, you know, an average Marcellus uh, well, for example, or shale well in general, um, when you're developing gas, can use millions of gallons of water. Um, in addition to that, um, lots of sand and chemicals go down in, um, down the hole as well to frack. And so all of that injected water and fluids um, that return to the surface is called flowback. Now both of these products um, can contain, uh, we've already talked about salts, lots of different chemicals depending on what fluids have been injected, and heavy metals and radioactive substances that are naturally occurring in the formation. How is this waste managed? It is stored at the well site, as the picture up here shows. Um, and it may be treated and um, then discharged either on land. Sometimes, um, if it, sometimes the pits will be drained and uh, remainers, remainders will be buried. It may be reused. Um, it's an increasing trend in the industry, given the volume of water that's needed for operators to try to treat, minimally treat the um, liquids and reuse them in fracking. Um, and again, as John will talk about, they're often injected underground in um, underground in injection control wells. And they may also be spread on land and roads. So on to solids. There we go. Um, this is a picture of a tub of drill cuttings, which is the most commonly um, managed type of solid waste. And this is at a landfill in West Virginia. Um, so the most, yeah, so drill cuttings make up the majority of your solid waste, and those are literally the cuttings, the ground up rock from the formation that's cut during drilling. So it's a very literal term. Um, and what drill cuttings can contain um, drilling fluids that have been used to lubricate the bit and to aid in drilling and fracturing, as well as chemicals, salts, metals, and radioactive substances because you are in effect during this during um, production, bringing up bits of the formation in which the gas and oil is, uh, is stored. And solid waste is managed primarily by uh, storing and burying it on site. Um, there are also reserve pits used where the solid waste is kept uh, temporarily. Um, and it may be, it's primarily disposed of if it's shipped off site at landfills or specialized facilities if it is detected as being radioactive. And that's a really long, complicated topic about radioactivity in solid waste. Um, should be happy to talk about more later. Um, 
or I'll refer you to some materials as well. But if the waste is detected as being highly radioactive, it is shipped generally to specialized facilities, um, but otherwise it can be buried on site or put in landfills. And then you have everything in between, or um, as many of us often call them, they're mystery mixtures, um, your sludges, muds, um, fracturing sand, and just different types of products that are kind of solid, kind of liquid, um, and they can contain fluids, chemicals, and oil um, that is used at all different stages of production. Um, and so even around, like if you pull up the drill cuttings, there will also be sludges and muds that have been used in the production process or that are just created between this, um, you know, throughout the production. Um, and those are managed sort of in the same way that solid waste is. They're generally stored temporarily at the well site. If they're going to be disposed of in a landfill, then landfills have to solidify and bulk them up with other materials. So that might include, as in the picture here, some wood chips um, and wood and, and sawdust. Um, there are also there's a whole range of materials that are used to kind of bulk them up and solidify them so that they pass uh, muster with the landfill um, so that they can then be treated as solid waste for the purpose of landfill disposal. Um, and then sometimes they are buried on site with the solid waste, uh, especially if they're held in a reserve pit, then they may just get rolled up in the pit liner and buried. Um, out west they're called toxic burritos, out in the east we call them toxic tea bags, um, but you can have a lot of solids and liquids in there. So a bit of a history lesson, um, just a quick look at history. How did we get here? Um, in 1988, the US EPA um, did a big study and look at whether um, oil and gas waste uh, should be treated as hazardous under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, also known as RICRA. Um, I think, can't see anyone here, obviously it's a webinar, but I think if I asked you uh, if you've heard of the Halliburton loophole, a lot of people would raise their hands. Um, that's the loophole in the Safe uh, Drinking Water Act uh, related to fracking. But there are actually seven major um, exemptions in federal laws, um, special loopholes in each law um, that give the oil and gas uh, industry special dispensation. And in the Resource Recovery, Resource Conservation Recovery Act, excuse me, um, that exemption is that oil and gas waste don't require federal regulation as hazardous. So essentially they don't have to be categorized as hazardous. And why? Um, the EPA at the time concluded that the state was the right level to regulate oil and gas waste and that state regulations were adequate. And they also recognized that if the oil and gas industry had to treat its and manage its waste as hazardous, it would have a negative economic impact. So that definitely figured into their decision. However, um, the EPA study that underpinned that decision at the same time said that a lot of the oil and gas waste would be hazardous if it wasn't for the exemption. And the EPA was very clear that under the definition of hazardous, which in RICRA is if, if waste is ignitable, corrosive, reactive, or toxic, that a lot of the waste would meet that definition and that it could still pose a hazard to human health and the environment. Um, and then as we've had growing scientific evidence that we know since that time, the waste uh, that has been tested contains a lot of different toxic substances, therefore meeting the definition of toxicity under RICRA, and lots of cases of waste pits igniting spontaneously, and so that certainly meets the definition of ignitable. So there's really no doubt that, it, that a lot of the waste would meet the definition of hazardous if it was, um, if it was ever tested or defined, uh, attempted to be defined as such. So a couple of years ago, um, Earthworks decided to take a deep dive into the waste issue and look at how these wastes are being managed in the four states in the Marcellus and Utica Shale, so Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and New York. And this um, report is available at wastingaway.earthworksaction.org, uh, and it also has a much uh, deeper discussion about the RICRA exemption and the different um, scientific uh, 
issues around radioactivity and toxicity and so on um, than we can get into tonight. But the basic takeaways of our research um, were that, was that states are starting to recognize the problem and they are making changes, but the efforts are very piecemeal and the oversight of the waste, meaning where it goes and how it's managed, is still very limited. Also limited is waste testing. It's done at the point of dispos disposal to tr actually determine what chemicals and toxic uh, substances might be in the waste. So it's done at the landfill, uh, maybe in a very limited way at a specialized treatment facility for liquids or solids, but not at the point of creation. So the operators themselves um, have to do very, very little characterization of the waste. Unfortunately, most of the waste is still classified as residual or solid, meaning that it's kind of rolled into existing categories of waste that we already have um, for our household waste or other types of waste that are managed by states, um, which means that existing treatment and disposal methods are used. Um, drill cuttings tend to be excluded from this T norm is technically Te technologically enhanced uh, naturally occurring radioactive material, which is a fancy way of saying that it um, would meet the classification of radioactive. Um, so that's what I meant by, you know, states lagging behind and playing catch up with all of this. They're just kind of rolling this waste under existing categories and methods of management rather than developing um, specialized ones. And then um, a big lesson in doing this research was that there really is limited uh, reporting and testing and tracking of the waste. Um, it's pretty hard to get data on waste categories and um, where it ends up and how much is being created. And there's very little um, what's called cradle to grave oversight, you know, from the well site where it's created to the landfill where it's disposed, for example, very hard to track um, and to have any kind of public data on that. So there's a pretty blurry picture overall, um, but based on the data we were able to get and what we were able to figure out, um, we, were, we were able to, um, to do quite a bit of analysis. So what's happening here? Um, you know, we'll probably talk more in the Q&A about the, the situation on the federal level right now, um, but, and going forward, but there have been some really positive steps in the right direction and we're going to keep pushing and move there. Um, in May of this year, several organizations um, under the Environmental Integrity Project and Earthworks and several others, we actually filed a lawsuit against the um, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to develop rules on the management of oil and gas solid waste. That's not the hazardous waste loophole, it's, a, it's just the management of solid waste at landfills and they haven't actually updated their rules in many, many, many years, and they're legally obligated to do it every three years. So, um, so we have that lawsuit going um, forward, and we'll see how that pans out. Um, also in September, the EPA um, de developed new guidelines that said that oil and gas waste water, liquids waste, cannot be disposed at municipal sewage treatment plants, um, also known as publicly owned treatment works, which are general wastewater plants um, where our sewage goes. And they recognized that this was happening in some states. It had been happening in Pennsylvania, though it's declined, the, the amount of that has declined in recent years. But it's still a risk that that happens. And that was a recognition of, the, of a growing body of science showing that wastewater um, contains toxic and possibly radioactive um, substances that cannot be removed at POTWs. And then um, Representative Matt Cartwright in Pennsylvania for the last few years has, re has introduced a bill called the um, Cleaner Act um, to close the hazardous waste loophole. And that would directly um, open up the possibility of oil and gas waste being tested and treated as hazardous and kind of the if it walks like a duck, then it is. Um, so that would close that, that very thorny hazardous waste loophole in, in the federal RICRA law. We've seen some positive movement on the state level. Um, there are a lot of states that are looking at this problem and starting to develop more stringent um, requirements for landfills and testing. Um, I'll just mention in Pennsylvania just did a rewrite of their oil and gas regulations and addressed the waste issue, for example, 
um, that you can't have um, open pits uh, to store the waste. They now um, would require radiation plan if you're going to process waste on site and also much more stringent permitting um, for, for impoundments and more frequent reporting which will help with the data gaps. Um, New York is currently looking at its regulations on solid waste management which opened up a lot of opportunities to discuss oil and gas waste and the key ask of Earthworks and all of our partners who've been involved in this process is that we don't have any disposal of oil and gas waste at landfills in New York no spreading of brine on roads and that the hazardous waste loophole um, that is replicated on the state level, so the RICRA loophole that all the states follow, that the state actually take this opportunity to close that loophole. And that's a huge opportunity. Um, so when we all think about you know, how to address this problem going forward, um, it is possible for, for states to make that change and close the hazardous waste loophole on their own. Um, you know, the federal regulation uh, does not prohibit states from going further. So that's where I'll end with that very quick overview of the waste issue and uh, how we got here. And uh, please stay in touch if you have any questions um, for me after. This is my email and phone number. And now I'm going to turn it over to John um, to hone in on the water issues and a very particular exemption and what's being done about it. So thank you very much. Hey everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Thanks, Nadia uh, and Earthworks for pulling these webinars together. I uh, I definitely just learned something there, so thank you. Um, my name is John Noel. I do national oil and gas policy at Clean Water Action, uh, and today I'm going to take the opportunity to talk about a little-known practice in the oil and gas industry that has a big impact or can have a big impact on local drinking water. Uh, and it's an issue that I think is going to remain a real threat uh, when drilling starts to increase in the future, which we know is coming. <clears throat> so the fundamental premise of the aquifer exemption program is that there are circumstances when EPA believes other interests are paramount to groundwater protection. Uh, and in our case, it risks prioritizing fossil fuel development over drinking water protection, uh, and it needs to have rigorous oversight. Um, so what I'll talk about briefly is covering some of the basic concerns with aquifer exemptions. We'll go over an update in two state investigations Clean Water Action is in, and then briefly what is next. Um, so as we know right now, in terms of liquid waste, there are roughly 10 times the amount of wastewater generated the actual resource, right? So in California, there will be 10 barrels of wastewater created for one barrel of oil. And all this waste needs to go somewhere. Uh, and the majority of it, roughly 90% of this wastewater is injected underground. Uh, and in some areas of the country, it's injected underground directly into potential sources of drinking water. Uh, and so injecting fluids underground is where an aquifer exemption uh, would come into play. So how does a company secure an aquifer? Well, actually, what is an, under an aquifer exemption? So under the Safe Drinking Water Act, all underground sources of drinking water are protected. It's one of a handful of landmark environmental laws. Um, and EPA defines an underground sources of drinking water with a water quality reading of 10,000 milligrams per liter total dissolved solids or shorthand 10,000 TDS. Uh, this is just a line in the sand of what EPA considers uh, treatable in terms of uh, drinking water quality. Oil and gas companies can get the federal protections on drinking water lifted and then inject wastewater and other fluids through injection wells directly into these once protected drinking water sources, essentially destroying them. And this whole process is regulated under EPA's UIC program. <clears throat> and the concept of an aquifer exemption first 
came about in the early 1980s when EPA was developing the UIC program. The oil and gas industry at the time lobbied EPA and they said, if all underground sources of drinking water are to be protected, uh, that will hinder oil and gas development in certain areas. So EPA decided to compromise and, and they wrote in this aquifer exemption provision into the UIC regulations. Um, UIC program in EPA regulates all fluid that is injected underground and it uh, divides this fluid up into six well classes. Uh, so for example, Class three wells would have to do with salt mining, and maybe a class six well would have to do with injecting carbon dioxide. But for the purposes of an aquifer exemption, we are mostly concerned with class two wells, uh, which are related to oil and gas activities. And there are two main activities that need an aquifer exemption for the most part. The first would be disposing oil and gas wastewater underground for permanent disposal. And the other would be for enhanced oil recovery, uh, which is the process of injecting uh, water, steam, chemicals underground to recover residual oil in depleted oil fields. And enhanced oil recovery you will likely start hearing more about because it's becoming an increasingly important technique uh, in the oil industry to recover more oil. Uh, and even in California, it's responsible for the majority of California's oil production. So that's a little background on what an aquifer exemption is. So how would a company uh, actually go about and get the federal protections on drinking water lifted so they can continue injecting? So in order to do that, a company must first prove that the aquifer that they want to inject their wastewater into is not a current source of drinking water, meaning that there are no drinking water wells currently pulling from that aquifer. The company also has to prove that it will not, the aquifer that they want to inject into will not serve as a source of drinking water in the future. Uh, and there are a number of ways that the oil and gas companies go about that in the regulations. They could say it's too deep, to economically access for drinking water, they can say it's too contaminated, or they're allowed to say that the mere presence of oil and gas and minerals within that drinking water in the same zones as that drinking water gives them the ability to lift the protections on it. And lastly, the oil and gas company could say that the water is above a certain threshold, so it's above 3,000 TDS, uh, and they should be allowed to inject into that potential drinking water source. And there are a number of concerns related to each one of these criteria that EPA has developed. Um, briefly, one of them is that water above 3,000 TDS is arbitrary, and it was written into the regulations 30 years ago. There are many municipalities, states, and locations across the country that are treating much higher TDS water for, for drinking. And so that's just one of the upfront concerns that we have with exempting an aquifer. <clears throat> um, management and enforcement of the aquifer exemption program in most states, it, most oil and gas area, areas is delegated to the states, but federal EPA has the final approval uh, on the decision to exempt an aquifer from federal protections. And so there are more concerns with this. Uh, one large concern that we have is that EPA, over, oops, EPA oversight over the program is inadequate. EPA does not have a full list, map, or understanding of where all the aquifers that have been exempted are throughout the United States. The program has been in existence for over 30 years, and they do not have an accurate picture of where exempted aquifers are located, uh, which we think is problematic. The public should know if they are living in an area with oil and gas development and that the aquifer that they're about to drill a water well into is polluted with oil and gas waste. Um, so this picture right here is a map we made with uh, EPA data from a year or so ago. It's data that EPA knows is incomplete and they're working uh, 
uh, to get a better picture of, but just roughly analyzing this data, there are 5,000 exempted aquifers across the country, and that number will grow, we know, because EPA doesn't have all the data it needs. 18% um, of those 5,000 don't have an exact location associated with it, and 66% of that 5,000 do not have water quality information associated with the aquifer. So if there is no water quality associated with it, how was it exempted in the first place? These are just some of the concerns we have. And of course, just to use California again, there's over 1,100 exempt aquifers in California, and this is also potentially problematic because the state's water supply is 40% dependent on groundwater, and during a drought that can, that can increase up to 75% on groundwater. So if we keep exempting groundwater from protections, uh, what does this say for future water supply? Um, there is a, the other problems with the aquifer exemption program aside from the EPA's oversight of it is the actual um, regulations themselves. So because the federal criteria were written 30 years ago, it does not, ref the concept of exempting an aquifer does not reflect recent changes in groundwater treatment technology as we went over. In some areas of the country, uh, states are treating water with saline water with over 30,000 TDS. The federal criteria for aquifer exemptions does also not account uh, changes in demand for drinking water as a result of climate change stressors and a number of other changes to water demand and increased competition for groundwater that were not in existence 30 years ago. Uh, so we think that the federal criteria for aquifer exemptions needs to be updated to reflect drinking water realities in 2016. Uh, meanwhile, the oil and gas industry continues to take advantage of these outdated rules. So that is also a problem. So what does the aquifer exemption program look like at the state level? And I'll go over two quick investigations that Clean Water Action was uh, involved with. So aquifer exemptions, uh, people may be familiar with, started on the scene about three years ago out in California. Clean Water Action and a few other groups started to ask questions of the state oil and gas agency and pressure the agency for information regarding uh, exempting aquifers from protection. It turns out in 2014, the State Oil and Gas Agency in California uh, admitted that there were at least 11 aquifers potentially wrongly exempt 30 years ago, and that there are thousands of disposal wells and enhanced recovery wells that were permitted potentially uh, without the correct oversight. <clears throat> there are also a number of individual injection wells that were ordered to shut down because they were injecting into directly into USDWs uh, without the proper aquifer exemption. Since then, California has been on a long road to recovery and has increased their transparency in the aquifer exemption process dramatically. There has been progress in, in of, of what was uh, the process three years ago was that a company would file an application with California. The California state agency would rubber stamp it send it to EPA, who would approve it, assuming that the analysis at the state level was adequate when it wasn't. Now, with increased outside pressure and attention, California is doing a much more in-depth evaluation of each aquifer exemption uh, and increasing the level of analysis needed to exempt an aquifer, and we think that is what is necessary across the country. Exempting an aquifer is to, dis is to exempt it forever, once you inject oil and gas wastewater or fluids into an aquifer and contaminate it, there is no remediation. You do not get that water back. And so that's why we believe the aquifer exemption program needs uh, the attention that it is not getting yet. Um, and, but although we were told, so when we first started getting into the, cal the problems in California, we were told by the oil and gas industry that the problems that were exposed in California were unique and that if you went to other states, other states didn't have the same problems with aquifer exemptions 
as California and it wasn't worth looking into. Uh, we thought uh, we might as well do it anyway and went to another state with uh, a large amount of oil and gas industry, which is Texas. Uh, Texas, we started uh, doing open records requests with the Te Texas Railroad Commission, which is the state agency which regulates oil and gas ac activity in Texas. Um, the Railroad Commission said that they had never issued an OCFA exemption, but the Railroad Commission at the same time has permitted over 50,000 Class II injection wells. So this would mean not one of those 50,000 wells was injecting into uh, underground source of drinking water, which is highly unlikely. It's highly unlikely due to our experience in other states and due to our knowledge of geology and injection wells, uh, we just did not think that was accurate. And it turns out uh, the Railroad Commission agreed uh, and they gave us evidence of at least two wells which we're injecting without an aquifer exemption. Um, and they are right now reviewing all 50,000 injection wells to make sure uh, that none are injecting without the proper aquifer exemption. And Clean Water Action came out with a report on that in August. What is next? Um, so Clean Water Action following the lead of uh, NRDC filed a legal petition last summer with uh, the federal EPA asking EPA to update its aquifer exemption rules. Uh, and we made the case that its rule regulations in current form leave drinking water vulnerable and they must be updated. Um, at the same time, we're calling for an immediate moratorium on all new aquifer exemptions until these new rules are put in place. We're also asking EPA to publish a full inventory of all aquifer exemptions nationwide. Uh, and that's something EPA has told us they're working on uh, and that should be published uh, within the next few months, hopefully. Uh, and then lastly, I, I, I'll end on saying something that we all recognize is that federal policies are designed as the floor for environmental protection, right? So progress can still be made uh, in terms of protecting drinking water from oil and gas development at the state level. And indeed, California, in terms of aquifer exemptions, is a very good example of state level progress uh, without EPA. So as we, as we transition into what is considered, what almost everyone would consider a hostile administration for oil for environmental uh, considerations, um, there's still progress that can be made at the state level. And lastly, also recognize that aquifer exemptions are a necessary part of expanded oil and gas development. Just like fracking is necessary, just like trucks are necessary, so too, in some areas, are aquifer exemptions, uh, and we, we need to, re to remain vigilant and definitely pay attention to this little-known aspect of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, here are a few resources. These are just three uh, papers that Clean Water Action has recently put out, and I am always available to talk uh, and in more detail about this and anything else. Thanks, John, and thanks, Nadia. Um, we do have some time to take questions. If you want to submit a question um, in the panel, your GoToWebinar panel, there's a section for questions, and we'll receive those directly. Um, and I'll start um, actually by asking Nadia, um, Nadia, what do you think that safe waste management would look like? That's a really good question, um, and I guess the first um, part of the answer is defining safe. Um, so probably given um, what we've just been talking about in terms of what the waste actually contains, the waste itself is unsafe. So I'm not sure that there ever would really be a safe, totally safe way of doing it, but there's a lot of things that could be done to make it safer and to ensure that the polluter um, you know, the principle of polluter pays uh, applies here so that the polluters who created the waste um, would also have to manage it more. Um, some of the recommendations we came to in, in our Wasting Away uh, report is to mandate chemical testing of all of the waste before they leave the well sites so that it's not such a huge burden um, on the 
waste managers and the haulers and that things can, you know, toxics can sneak into landfills, um, have much more comprehensive mandated chemical testing. Um, we definitely believe there should be no open air storage, no burial on site, and no spreading on roads. Um, this waste needs to be treated and disposed of differently. Um, and treated and disposed of at specialized facilities only. So I mentioned, you know, it can't send wastewater to our regular sewage treatment plants, but nor should this uh, waste be going into regular landfills. At this stage of the game, um, you know, John, John just said there are all these aspects that the industry needs to keep developing, and after decades of development and many years of, in the shale boom with these what the industry considers to be very high-level technologies, uh, it's pretty high time uh, that the industry should also find a better way um, to treat and dispose of the waste at, at specialized facilities. And then we'd also like to see um, cradle-to-grave tracking um, so that we can, the public uh, can know exactly what is being created and where it's going. Um, those manifests should exist throughout the entire uh, chain of the waste. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll ask John um, to maybe speak to what could be improved, um, you know, with the UIC program as well to make it safer. Yeah, thanks, Nadia. I mean, there, there are... Um, just, in, just in terms of aquifer exemptions, you could increase, you could require a number of public notification requirements. So for each aquifer exemption, there has to be a public hearing, a local public hearing, and there has to be a public comment process that should be required. Um, publishing a full inventory so everyone in the country knows where aquifer exemptions are. Um, and then there are a number of technical aspects to the UIC program uh, w which we produced in a UIC report that I could send around which people could get more in-depth ideas of what can be improved at the federal UIC level. There are a lot of states, California again as an example, is making progress in terms of updating their UIC regs and that is something that we'd like to see in a number of other states with heavy oil and gas development. Thank you guys, those are great answers. Um, so we have a few more questions here and I'll try to move through them. Um, this question is from Alberta, Canada, but I think it applies um, definitely to many areas in the United States. And Andrew asks, how can we protect our groundwater and surface water when our provincial or state government is captured by the oil and gas industry? Well, that, that's a great question. It's a big question, um, and it, yes, it definitely implies, uh, applies to the U.S. as well. Um, I think that the major thing that is going to keep working, um, which we're seeing it works, is public pressure. Um, so, you know, the more, it, yes, it's very difficult to say appeal to your local government level and then find out that they're captured either through leasing or economic um, incentives, um, but I think the you know the the anti-fracking movement um, proves the strength of it, proves just what public opinion and public pressure can do. Um, we you know I think that that those of us who are steeped in the waste issues would really like to see um, waste uh, take on a you know a greater role in in the kind of fights um, that are going on. So. Just don't give up. Go to the media. You know, if you're interested in particular resources or particular ideas um, for the specific issues in your community, um, definitely contact me, um, and we could we could brainstorm more about that. I'd be really interested in knowing um, more about what's going on. But the capture and the influence of the industry in our politics is obviously a huge and growing problem. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, John. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, politics is all about who shows up, so public pressure and persistent public pressure, I think, is what's necessary. It's sometimes people bring up all these issues and, and there are egregious violations that the oil and gas industry does on a daily basis, but it's persistent pressure for local, local and state authorities to follow up and improve conditions on the ground that's necessary. 
there was so, so like years ago, I think it was a contamination event in Pennsylvania, which led to this new ban on wastewater sent to municipal treatment plants. But it took four or five years to get that passed. Right. Um, so it, it's it's persistent uh, attention to the problems that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Well said. Okay, let's go back to the question board. Um, I have a couple questions from Heidi in California. Monterey County um, recently passed a measure, Measure Z, that uh, banned new oil and gas drilling. It was one of the greater things to come out of the election. Um, and she's wondering, so in addition to the ban, it also requires all existing oil and gas operators to recycle 100% of their wastewater on site. She's wondering how feasible this is, both technologically and economically. Um, well, I'll take a crack at that. Um, in terms of the recycling and reuse, um, it's feasible to a point, um, and 100 percent, that would be unbelievable. Um, the figures that we've seen out of Pennsylvania is that it's more, you know, where they've been tracking this and where operators say they've been doing it for a longer time, you know, has been maybe 15 to 20 at times. I mean, there's, it's just, we've never, industry often says that they are doing 100% recycling or they can do it. Um, there might be companies that do it in certain circumstances. Um, and then when I say to a point, it's because even if you process the fluids to be able to reuse them, and that's definitely great because especially in a state like California, any amount of the produce water that you can reuse is less fresh water that you're using. Um, but after a while, I mean, this it's so heavily contaminated with salts and chemicals that you're going to be left with some sort of polluted, contaminated product that has to be treated and disposed. And they're, throughout using it and reusing it and processing it, um, some of those contaminants can be, become even more concentrated. So it's just something to stay vigilant about and to, and to you know, why this issue of needing to take the waste to specialized facilities is also really important. Um, there are some of these specialized wastewater treatment plants in Pennsylvania, for example, that treat the, wa the water so that processors can reuse it. And even at the end of that, they end up with what are called filter cakes from the filtration system, and those are highly toxic and, high and, and radioactive. So it's really important to have that commitment. Fantastic that commitment exists. Um, let's hope they do it and that they also, in the meantime, find a solution for the end product of it all. Um. Thanks, Nadia. I think this is another uh, great specific question. So what happens when you have a fracking site in one state, but you take the waste in another state and dispose of it? What role does the US EPA have to do with receiving states, and what kind of help can they get? Um, John, you may have something to add to this, but it's really because the waste is managed and transported between waste disposal facilities, which are very often, they may be like municipal landfills or municipal um, treatment plants, or the, but they may also be private businesses, like a, like a wastewater uh, treatment facility for oil and gas waste. And the, many landfills are managed as private businesses. So it's not something actually that the EPA gets involved in. It's not the same as like an interstate pipeline when you have the interstate transfer of waste. It's really up to the, the hauler who is, or the producer of the waste, or the waste manager that is sending the waste and the recipient of the waste to work it out. Um, and this question underscores a really big issue. Um, and we looked at it a bit at, in Wasting Away in terms of the flow of the waste around, across borders. There's a lot of waste that, that just crosses borders all the time, as, as, the, per, as the person asking the question indicates. Um, and unfortunately, that it comes down to state-level regulations. Um, we need states to start paying attention to the waste that's coming in and the volumes that are coming in, which is where a lot of the fight in New York is right now, for example, that um, you know, regulators weren't really paying attention to just how much was coming in, and now they are. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I don't know, John. Thanks, John. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know, John, if you have anything to add to that about, um, you know, specifically if water, wastewater comes from one state into the other, into another that might have more aquifers or, or yeah, no, UIC programs. It, it seems like they, you know, as you know, they're, when they're moving waste around, you're just, they're passing the pollution burden from state to state. And in, in Pen it just, and it also depends on how, what's the final way to dispose of the wastewater. So in Pennsylvania, if there's a if it's fracked wastewater from Pennsylvania, there are no underground injection wells in Pennsylvania. But the, and if there are a few, and they're regulated by EPA, so a lot of that waste is shipped to say West Virginia, where there are lots of UIC wells. And those are not regulated by EPA, but by the West Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, or whatever it is down there. So it's passing from federal regulations in terms of Pennsylvania to state regulations in the surrounding states. Right. So I think I'm going to wrap this up with uh, one question that combines four or five different questions that we've gotten about the safety of um, waste and wastewater. So there are examples of waste being used instead of salt on roads. Um, there are examples of wastewater being used to water crops in California. Um, and apparently in West Virginia, there's a company that is trying to extract the salt from the waste and sell it. Um, what are some of the safety concerns and um, what can be done about it? Really important question. I would say that the overarching safety concern is that the science hasn't been done. Um, we've heard um, a bit about the, you know, the push in California to use um, oil and gas wastewater on crops, and the science to demonstrate what the hazards are and to demonstrate that it's safe um, just haven't been done. So it kind of invokes the age-old concept of the precautionary principle, which is that if something, if there's a risk to a certain practice, it is incumbent upon the, the person, or in this case the entity, the industry, wanting to do the action to prove it safe first, that we need to take a stance of precaution. So that's the biggest problem. There's no end to innovation in the oil and gas industry, and the concept of oh, we have this problem, well, here's our quick fix. Um, but the science that has been done on waste demonstrates its hazards, as we've been discussing, um, but we don't have the science to demonstrate that these practices are indeed safe. Um, so I would say the first thing to do is to try to get these practices prohibited um, on the local level, get ordinances against them, um, push your state regulators to not allow this, until it has been demonstrated safe. And that could take some time, because science can take a little time. Um, so, Yeah, I, I would agree. We've been involved in some of the early conversations out in California in terms of trying to apply produced water to agriculture. And the science is not there at all. And we don't even know the full list of chemicals that are in the wastewater to begin with. And that is because the industry has resisted any push for transparency in that area. So if, by not being forthcoming what's in their wastewater, it's actually harming their own efforts to dispose of it in other ways. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. And, and also, lastly, it's not up to the public and NGOs to provide uh, the correct way and the safe way for the oil and gas industry to handle its own practices. It's up to them, like you said, Nadia, to prove to us that it's safe. I think that's a great place to end. Uh, thank you, Nadia and John. If you guys had any last words, now's a good time, and then I will end the webinar. Just thanks, everybody, for being on and having an interest in the waste issue. Um, it's sometimes been referred to as the one of the uh, Achilles heels of the industry, that they can't go on ignoring it forever. So I think the more that we engage in it, and if you live somewhere where you're getting waste, um, definitely get involved and I think John and I and uh, we'll both and our organizations would be very interested in hearing from you and hopefully we can uh, keep the dialogue going. Yeah, same. Ha happy to talk more with anyone uh, offline if you want to circle back with me. Thank you for everyone who was able to join us. Thank you, Hillary. Thanks everyone um, for being on. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks.